So this is about uh, interference handling for, for Li-Fi. So as, as uh, Cheng Ding introduced, it is also related to standardization in ITU. And uh, this presentation is based on a joint effort that uh, has been done uh, between Signify and uh, Next Linear. So you see also the names uh, of the people that contributed most to this, to this effort. So my, my talk is uh, divided in four uh, small parts. Uh, so the motivation, so why do we need interference handling? Some initial considerations, uh, and then the main part, of course, is to is to how to to you how to um, address the standardization, and finally, uh, I will introduce to some controller options for the for the handling of the interference. So first, uh, as Amir on introduced, uh, we have this uh, true Li-Fi product uh, where uh, the Li-Fi system can uh, serve a single room. Uh, where we have uh, what I call optical front ends and I'm here call them transceivers. And, uh, and this is uh, also, this transceiver can be in the ceiling and in, as a dongle uh, attached to the laptop. Uh, I use a slightly different terminology for access point. Uh, for me, the access point uh, is equal to what I'm here calls the, the modem. So the access point is the protocol engine uh, that uh, is able to serve multiple optical front ends uh, and, uh, and by that having a certain coverage. Sorry, so, sorry Chris, uh, yeah. some audience mentioned that uh, your slide may be not uh, present properly. So we may see only part of the, your, scre your screen. We maybe. only see the middle part, uh, Dries. Oh. Uh, uh, maybe share again and... I will share my screen the then. Moment. So I was sharing the presentation. Um, Thanks. Let's see. Where is the Zoom share screen? Share. Okay, this looks yes, much better. Yeah. yeah. Is this better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this was just introducing the true life product and, and some terminology. So where we have the access point representing the modem connected to multiple optical front ends or transceivers and the end user device, the laptop uh, with, uh, with a dongle, which we call the endpoint. Um, as Amir said, so we can connect up to op six optical front ends per access point, uh, and all the optical front ends carry the same data, and uh, there can be up to 16 endpoints connected to a single access point. Now, what is the intention of, uh, of the interference handling? So if we have a single user, uh, I think uh, it's, it's quite clear, and uh, one way is to scale up is by uh, connecting multiple optical front ends to the same modem or to the same access point. But if you want to grow your network to, let's say, an open office environment, uh, you could think of, okay, adding more optical front ends, but there is, of course, a limit in that. So uh, I think only from uh, the uh, technical point of view, it, it is a limit, uh, but also you, you have to share the bandwidth between all the users uh, with one access point. So there is a limit on, on extending this, this range. So the option to extend is to have multiple modems or multiple optical front ends, uh, multiple access points uh, in this configuration as, as been, been said before and connect those access points via backbone and uh, let them interwork with each other. Uh, another option could be to integrate even access point or modem and optical front end as a single into a single device, and then you have more flexibility in the scaling. Uh, it, it comes to a cost, of course, because now uh, every uh, optical front end should carry also a modem. The penalty of this, let's say, approach is that at the overlapping areas of the access points, you will have interference. So this is the motivation <coughs> for us to uh, to handle the interference and to come uh, with solutions for it. So some initial considerations. So uh, if you have overlapping coverage areas of multiple access points, 
uh, the known concept is uh, to have channels that are different uh, to, to resolve the interference between the neighboring access points. We have done some considerations. So could we do that in frequency, this separation, this channel allocation? But note for Li-Fi, we do not use the frequency as a carrier, like for example, the five gigahertz in, in Wi-Fi, but we only use the baseband. Uh, we can separate the baseband in, in sub-channels, but then it's, let's say it's normally done by a single modem. Uh, we have some doubts what happens if you do it by multiple modems and uh, can you separate the, uh, enough in the frequency. So the carrier instead of the high frequency is, uh, is here wavelength. So we might also consider wavelength division. But again, here we are doubting how could can we do that with, uh, with optical filters? Do they really separate the different wavelengths? And also <clears throat> from a hardware point of view, how flexible would it be? So at least for the short term, we had some doubts uh, in this direction. Uh, therefore, we were looking towards time division uh, where we thought, okay, time can be flexibly divided. Uh, we, with the current product, we only need to change the software and we can reuse the available hardware. Penalty of course is then that you have a single shared medium that has to be shared, so we might uh, have some performance reduction. For the longer term, we are aiming at what we call sectorization or narrow beams, steerable narrow beams, which opens new possibilities like having parallel streams uh, using make use of MIMO, but with the penalty that we need to build new hardware. So for the time being, we were focusing on the time division uh, approach. Uh, for the time division, there are basically two basic concepts. So one is what is called contention-based access, where uh, each device uh, senses the medium before it uh, starts to, uh, to, to use the medium. So it's a kind of listen before talk. And we have contention-free access, or otherwise called uh, time division multiple access, where the time to, to uh, transmit is scheduled. This picture shows the basic concepts. Um, due to the time, I'm not going into the details, but as you see here, so as long as the, as the channel is busy, a device waits. And here, uh, there is a called, uh, for example, in the ITU, there is a called uh, so-called medium access plan that indicates how a max cycle is organized and who is uh, allowed to access at which moment of time. The disadvantage of this contention-based access, as Jean-Paul already indicated, so under heavy load, uh, this does not work very well. So you get uh, larger delays, uh, congestion of the network, but it shoots well to uncoordinated systems. So systems that where there is a distributed approach, so every device that wants to access can do, and there is no central controller needed. So for the TDMA-based access, uh, it's much more efficient on the heavy load because everything is organized, but you need then also to coordinate. So someone has to make the schedule. So what are the interference situations? So if we have a single access point and multiple endpoints, and if both uh, endpoints are sending at the same time, they will interfere towards the access point. That's, let's say, the basic situation where, where you always have to take care of. So this is something that the access point may take care of on its own, on itself. But if you have multiple access points, uh, yeah, in the uplink, uh, you get multiple uh, interferences, but also in the downlink from access points, one and access point two, they will interfere uh, their communication towards endpoint number two, because it is in the overlapping area. An additional problem compared to uh, RF is that in uh, optical communication, this links, the downlink and the uplink are optically separated. So nodes, uh, for example, those access points don't see each other. So they cannot use this so-called carrier-based uh, access very well because uh, they don't see each other. So they cannot uh, sense if the medium is busy or not. So it does not work. So for that, we said, okay, then the solution is be to apply TDMA 
and to coordinate the access point to resolve the interference. Now, how does it work? Uh, at least what we need is that uh, access points, uh, an access point that is not, where an endpoint is not, let's say, registered to, uh, should be able to be detected so that uh, uh, there is something in the access point that the endpoint can detect and then report to its uh, access point to which it is associated. And that's for the downlink uh, interference detection and for the uplink interference detection, something similar. What we also need is a kind of uh, is a is a common time base for the access point because uh, otherwise, if you coordinate the uh, time slots in the max cycles, they need to be aligned because otherwise you still have a, a confusing uh, situation. Now, for the standardization, we were considering uh, different standards. One is a quite old standard, it's, uh, or let's say not old standard, but a standard in, the, in development that is based on an old standard, ATA 257, um, which has been uh, uh, made quite some years ago, this 157, uh, but the 1513 is a kind of improvement for the higher bit rates and, uh, and, and well, and it is based also on something that is also in the ITU standards. We also have the ITU standards where we have, uh, as Amir told, we have this OVM, which is very good uh, for uh, and adaptive bit loading, which is very good for lab-based uh, communication. And uh, both standards, the 1513 and the 9991, uh, both support CSMA and TDMA. And as I said, so TDMA is very important to handle the interference. Then there is an extra activity uh, on the 802.11 uh, where uh, there is some lack of those features that are available in 9.9.1. So first, of course, it, is, uh, uh, it doesn't uh, support adaptive bit loading and it also doesn't support TDMA. So from a technical point of view, it has some disadvantages. From a commercial point of view, uh, there are also some considerations that for the 1513, we see that the ecosystem is quite limited and there are no ICs available to support the standard at the moment. Where for the uh, 802.11bb, so there is a very large ecosystem. So that was the reason to start the 11bb uh, after the 157 was not very successful. But uh, we are struggling here with, the, with those technical challenges and uh, it is also very hard to adapt the uh, existing ICs to, to, the, to the new situation for Li-Fi. So these considerations uh, uh, led to the 9991 where the standard was already available early 2019. There is a reasonable ecosystem and there are ICs available that fit for Li-Fi. So therefore the 991 is the first choice to, to start with. So how do we use the uh, max cycle, so the, uh, the data link layer in uh, ITU for, for Li-Fi? So you have a number of succeeding max cycles in which uh, time slots are defined. And in each max cycle, there's a so-called medium access plan that indicates the schedule for the next cycle. And in the next cycle, then the transmission opportunities are scheduled for every endpoint. Now, what we need is a common clock uh, for aligning the max cycles of the access points, which can, for example, be based on an existing standard, but it can also be a separate wiring uh, providing this common clock to all the different access points. We also introduced something that we call uh, a common channel <clears throat> and this channel is uh, used for <clears throat> advertising the presence of the access points and the endpoints. So in this channel, there are, there is, uh, there are transmission opportunities for the endpoints to advertise themselves <clears throat> and also for the access points to advertise themselves so that the uh, detection of neighbors can, can be implemented. 
in order to save time, so not to make this common channel too large, uh, we have implemented uh, only uh, 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 very short uh, advertisement frames where only the frame header is used and in the frame header, the identifier is uh, included. So that was on the uh, interference detection. Uh, now, what uh, we call in ITU is the domains. Well, in, do in ITU, there is this principle of domains. So where there is a domain master, in our case, it is the access point and the number of nodes that uh, belong to this domain. So this is the concept of different domains and the domains can also interfere with each other. So this is already known in the ITU, but it's basically uh, made for a power line communication if there is an, uh, if your neighbor is interfering with you on the power line. It does not include anything of the mobility and then the wireless uh, aspects. So what we introduced is a, is a functionality which we call Li-Fi controller that is doing this uh, TDMA uh, uh, coordination. So it's coordinating the access points to resolve the interference. So it's uh, the, the, the procedure is as follows. So the access point that has received reporting from neighbors of endpoints and all report to this Li-Fi controller uh, what kind of nearby nodes are visible. And then the Li-Fi controller puts constraints to this access point uh, to limit their scheduling. So if I want to visualize that, so if you have those two access points and those and the max cycle with this common channel, the Li-Fi controller is putting constraints. For example, it is saying for two access point X that this endpoint is only allowed to send or, or to communicate. <coughs> only in this part, the uh, access point is allowed to communicate to this endpoint. And then the other access point is disallowed to communicate in this area. And the same for the, for the other uh, endpoints, endpoint Y. So this is how the Li-Fi controller then solves the interference. Now this Li-Fi controller, uh, we have considered several options. And this is also an introduction to the next uh, speaker. Uh, we have considered, okay, everything can be centralized as is, in, in, uh, the control can be centralized as being shown, shown in the picture before. So in this case, there is a kind of master controller that collects all the neighbor information and then calculates a schedule for the access points or at least the constraints. Another extreme is that we distribute this functionality over the access points and then you need to exchange information between the access points. So the, let's say the distributed controller elements and each local local controller calculates then this local schedule and then exchange the schedule to his neighbors. So you see here there's a kind of iterative uh, loop because each uh, local entity cannot calculate the best uh, schedule uh, on its own. So you need some iteration on that. This brings us to the advantages and disadvantages of those different approaches. So if you have a centralized approach, you have a global optimum, optimum but you are depending on this master. So, and the information in one place helps to realize the optimal set scheduling. Another advantage is that it is easy to maintain because you have a central entity that can be maintained quite easily. An advantage of a distributed control is that it is independent from the master, but it is a suboptimum. But when the master fails or the communication with the master fails, then the system can continue to work. And another advantage is, so if, you, if your network scales, as was my original uh, motivation for interference handling, it also scaled, this controller scales then with the number of Wi-Fi access points. So these are considerations that uh, are taken. Sorry, Twiss. Yes. Uh, sorry, Twiss. I'm not sure how many slides you uh, still have. Only one. Um, so, Only one. Okay, okay, please. So I'm, I'm wrapping up. That sucks. Yeah. Mm. So we have, uh, oh, two, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so this was this was the, uh, the centralized versus distributed, and there is another way of let's say looking at. So you can have a coarse uh, uh, time division, uh, which is very simple and uh, very cost effective. But you have some ways of scan uh, bandwidth, and you have cost can also have a fine scheduling. 
so where you uh, separate the uh, different uh, slots, uh, pair slots, but you have a more complex uh, solution. So we have a two level approach uh, as a kind of compromise where the Wi-Fi controller is making uh, her first uh, division in time, with, uh, which is quite coarse. And then uh, there is uh, the use uh, of those time uh, uh, channels uh, where the uh, access points are not completely restricted to their original uh, allocated time channels, but can also use uh, outside of these time channels uh, by applying some, some rules and restrictions to it. So this is the, let's say, the, the introduction also to the next speaker, uh, which will go a little bit deeper into uh, to these different uh, types of algorithms and how to optimize then uh, this, uh, this uh, scheduling for interference. 